Hello, welcome back to the channel. Uh, there's a couple things. So first off, I want to apologize. Um, I meant to post last week, but I had a scheduling conflict and I knew it was there. I knew it was coming um, and I still managed to mess up my schedule and not get around to posting. So <clears throat> I apologize. Um, <clears throat> second, uh, two weeks back, I posted a review of the complete works of Edgar Allan Poe and um, got a rather interesting comment. Um, if you're interested in my thoughts on the comment, on um, what I um, uncovered in researching more information about the comment, uh, let me know. I, I, I've been debating whether or not to do a, um, <clears throat> a reaction video to that comment. I just don't know if reaction video is really the right way to say it because <clears throat> I've already reacted, but uh, in a sense it is still a, my reaction to the comment. The actions that I took in uh, response to, to the comment. So if you're interested in that, hey, let me know in the comments down below um, <clears throat> and maybe I'll throw together something uh, on what I was able to uncover in looking up the co the comment. Uh, anyway, um, <clears throat> this week I wanted to talk about um, another book by Umberto Eco. Um, this one, Foucault's Pendulum. Now I've read other books by um, by Professor Eco. And I say professor because he actually was a professor. Um, he taught, if I remember right, in Milan, uh, at the University of Milan. Um, <clears throat> it's rather interesting. Uh, he's kind of... Um, there. So several years ago, there was a huge to-do about um, the Da Vinci Code. So a book came out it's about Da Vinci Code. Um, <clears throat> interestingly enough... Um, Professor Echo, if I remember right, is is actually a real life. Um, I forget the main character in the Da Vinci Code. I forget his name, um, but he's actually that guy. But he's the Italian one. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, interestingly enough, that's what um, he is a professor of. So anyway. Uh, I've read several of his books, The Island of the Day Before, uh, The Mysterious Flame of Queen Loana, um, what's the, uh, um, let's see, Foucault's Pendulum, obviously, The Name of the Rose, uh, I reviewed Badalino, um, which is also by, 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 by Professor Echo, um, <clears throat> it's just too bad that he passed away in 2016. Uh, I would have loved to have met this guy. Um, anyway, so in, one of one of the kind of unique things about um, the books that I've read um, by Professor Echo um, are that um, he gives a lot of backstory into the people involved. Um, we, we're introduced to, um, three people in, um, in Foucault's Pendulum. They are Casalbon, uh, Belbo, and Diotalevi. Uh, <clears throat> and, um, I'm trying to remember, I can't remember off the top of my head who the main character is, uh, but he, uh, we basically follow him through uh, a, through his, his young life, growing up, um, going through college, getting a job after college, um, uh, getting you know getting involved with this whole uh, mess that ends up um, spurring the story of Foucault's Pendulum. <clears throat> now we. We have a lot of information about uh, this guy, about how he thinks, about who he is. Uh, so 
we we get to know the characters quite in depth. Um, so I feel that's a, a very interesting take. And in fact, uh, I don't know if it was me. I don't know where it came from. Probably wasn't me. But um, I have heard parallels drawn. Say probably wasn't me, so yeah, uh, it almost definitely wasn't me. But I'm not sure where the source the source was. But parallels drawn between Foucault's Pendulum and the Da Vinci Code, and how Foucault's Pendulum is the much better version of the <sighs> sorry about that of the Da Vinci Code. So yeah, um, let me turn that off while I'm thinking about it, so we don't get interrupted like that again. Um, <clears throat> So, we have Foucault's Pendulum. Let's get back to that. Now, Foucault's Pendulum was a um, an experiment uh, with a pendulum that was used to show that the Earth turned. Um, if you've been to planetariums, sometimes uh, natural history museums, children's museum sometimes they'll have these great they'll have these these big pendulums suspended from from uh, the ceiling and around a circle they'll have uh, little uh, things that are set up around the outside and as you swing the pendulum the the pendulum swings back and forth and knocks down these uh, these little objects uh, the last one I saw, they were basically these, uh, it was a metal pendulum, and it had these, I don't know, they were painted silver, so they could have been metal, most likely they were wood, but they were um, basically hinged against the floor. And as the pendulum came, it, it hit and knocked it over, and then you could go and just flip them back up. Uh, but the thing is, is if the earth didn't turn, then the pendulum would uh, would just go back and forth in a straight line and it would never move but because the earth turns underneath it it the pendulum is still swinging in a straight line back and forth and it and it doesn't move but because the earth turns underneath it um, it knocks down these pegs around the around the the circle around the pendulum and so you can see that the earth is turning underneath um, doing this the earth is turning underneath as the pendulum swings back and forth and so <clears throat> it showed that the the earth did m rotate anyway um so what happens is you have these three guys they're very uh highly educated uh, men and they're working for a publishing house now this is this is uh, kind of a weird uh, thing about publishing that I'd never heard of, uh, and I don't know how true it is, but uh, this um, publishing company they worked for was, so they published books on, uh, on uh, very niche subjects. And I mean niche in the sense of like uh, conspiracy theories and like aliens, extraterrestrials, things like that. Uh, and what happened was uh, the the publishing company was di like divided in half. You had um, on the one side was like the front face the 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 that the public saw um, and that part of the publishing company, they were the ones that published best sellers and you know, the Harry Potters and uh, um, the Da Vinci Code and things like that that were just runaway bestsellers. Now you had the other side, and this is where these three guys worked. Now the other side was um, basically it seemed a bit uh, dishonest in, in my opinion. Basically uh, somebody would come to the one publishing house and would say, hey, I have this manuscript, I'd really like to get it published. And they'd look at it and they'd say, mm, this is not going to be financially successful for us. So, um, yeah, um, basically they, they wouldn't 
tell the author that his work was trash and, and that uh, they wouldn't publish it. Basically, what they would say is, this isn't really the kind of thing that we, that we do. This isn't, this is our market. Um, and so what they would, they, that's basically their reaction. And so in this person would then be going away dejected and they'd say, however, we do know another publishing company. They're actually just right around the corner. This might be right up their alley. And so they would direct them to this other publishing company, which was really just the same publishing company. And, um, now, you're sitting there thinking, well, how would they make money if this wasn't, you know, a financially viable product? Well, what they would do is they'd get the, the guy to come in. They'd edit it. They'd put it together. Um, <clears throat> they'd give him the, the author's copy, you know, all that stuff. <clears throat> and then basically they would um, just sit on the books. They wouldn't actually, like, market them or try to get them sold or anything like that. And... And at one point, they would basically come to the author and they'd say, okay, uh, this is the deal. Uh, your books aren't really selling that well, uh, and we've got a whole box of them, um, you know, like 100 books or whatever, and uh, we're, we're just going to have to, like, recycle them because, you know, you know, nobody's buying them. We don't want them to take up space in our warehouse. Uh, and they would kind of hint that there was something that the author could do if they wanted to, which was basically pay for all the books and then the author would have a box of 100 books so this is why i said it was kind of shady well anyway like i said these three guys and i'm going way overboard in in, in what's going on here but anyway these three guys they're constantly bombarded with um uh, these conspiracy theories now um one of the most uh, prevalent conspiracy theories in the world um, surrounds um, a, so uh, Professor Echo he grew up in Italy so he grew up with a lot of Catholic influence and um, so you what I what I see is I see a lot of that in his books um, you know Badolino had a lot of uh, christian mythology uh, that i was not aware of because i was not raised in that culture i am christian but i'd never heard of prester john i'd never heard of um that the the kingdom in the east with all of the weird creatures and stuff um never heard of that uh in the island of the day before there's a lot of alchemy and and things like that uh that i have since delved into because of I've read about it. But anyway, um, so there's a lot of these conspiracy theories that surround the Holy Grail and um, the the Knights Templar. Uh, so the Knights uh, were a really big power in uh, medieval Europe, and they were destroyed because, um, depending on who you believe, um, that they were a threat against, you know, the power of the Pope. And so the Pope had them destroyed because uh, they were becoming too powerful. Anyway, uh, so there's legends and things about how, you know, the um, the Knights Templar, because they were involved with uh, getting people, you know, pilgrimages to the Holy Land and all that stuff, that they were actually the ones that knew where the Holy Grail was, that it was in their keeping, and that uh, because... Uh, the fact that the whole the the Knights Templar were destroyed, the Holy Grail was lost, but um, the they were they were the keepers of the Holy Grail, and only they knew where it was, and they moved it around so that it, it, there's a bunch of stuff. So anyway, these three guys they're constantly uh, reading these manuscripts about these um, these just off the wall bizarre conspiracy theories, and I shouldn't necessarily say off the wall and bizarre, but what I should say is that um, they're, what they did is they took all of these conspiracy theories and they changed it into a narrative. Uh, and they basically then anonymously leaked their, uh, their, their narrative 
to the public. I shouldn't. I that's even going a little bit too far. It wasn't really the public. It was like these these um, conspiracy theorists. Let them know about it. Like kind of leaking here and there that they had gotten you know this story from this source and this, and, and then put it into a, a narr- crafted it into a narrative. And <clears throat> see, this is where. Like, this is where you have the difference between Dan Brown's The Da Vinci Code and you have uh, Umberto Eco's uh, Foucault's Pendulum, is that um, um, these three guys, they were just, it was it was their way to kind of joke with the conspiracy theory community that uh, there was this conspiracy out there that maybe there was some truth to it and they created this narrative that joined the the dots and so they get then uh, caught up in uh in what in what ensues because all of these various secret societies and conspiracy theorists think that these men know a lot more than they do a lot more than they're letting on and so it then becomes a very dangerous game that they're playing so Anyway, um, highly deep, uh, very uh, uh, thoughtful, uh, quite interesting in terms of the history of the the different secret societies and the different uh, people who uh, were in play back in medieval time uh, and the different thoughts on Holy Grail and who had it and what um, the the timeline was and... um, who was involved quite quite interesting very deep um, deep dive into that kind of world Um, as always i have been impressed so i've read several of his books i i have uh the Prague cemetery on my bookshelf to read uh, and i plan to continue to look for books by uh, professor echo and add them to my library as as i can um because I have immensely, immensely enjoyed his 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 work, but like I said, they're usually not light reading, if you will. They are usually very dense, um, very uh, very thoughtful in their execution, very well planned. Um, he is a professor of and the I, I believe the term is um, semiotics which is the study of symbols and symbology, symbolism. So you get a lot of that stuff in his books. So they're quite, quite deep, quite, quite uh, packed with these um, these images. In fact, um, uh, the mysterious flame of Queen Loana, uh, he even includes... A lot of those symbols, modern symbols, in in the work as you're reading through it. So it's, um, and I'll talk about that another time. But anyway, highly enjoyable, um, though a deep read. Uh, so if you're if you're looking for a, a enjoyable book that's very very thought provoking, uh, that's this is the way to go. Um, until next time, enjoy what you're reading. Like, subscribe, comment down below. Uh, Turn the bell on so you get the notifications. Later.